Shabbat Shalom, my friends. Well, even as the secular year rushes to its close, even as winter has rapidly entered our calendar, so too the stories of Genesis move swiftly to their necessary conclusion. Next week, we will read the final sedra of the book of Genesis and then have a tasty siyum as well. The total purpose of Genesis will have been achieved. Jacob and his family, the Israelites, would have been settled in Egypt. The book of Exodus stands ready to hold up before us slavery, redemption, revelation. The Jewish people is now ready to be born. First, we offer our prayers for the Chatufim, the Israeli hostages now being held by Hamas. We offer our prayers for the soldiers of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. We offer our prayers for the innocents, Israelis, Palestinians, whose suffering does not yet appear to be at an end. And we offer our prayers for a just, enduring, secure peace that will bring stability and comfort for Israel. Cain Yehi Ratzon. May such an outcome be our will. Okay, our sedra is Vayigash. Genesis 44, 18 to 47, 27. The details here in this sedra seem designed to complete a very complex picture. Joseph reveals his identity, and he does so in a way that avoids blame and places everything into the hands of God. No matter what the intentions of the brothers, God's vision is to guarantee the survival of of Jacob and of his family. And interestingly, to keep you alive so that you might experience a great deliverance in the future. Into Joseph's mouth is placed the prophecy of both slavery an ultimate redemption. How are we to understand Joseph? It's a very hard question. For most of us are predetermined, pre-programmed to connect Joseph to a Broadway play centering around an amazing technicolor dream coat. In that play, Joseph was blonde, handsome, certainly knew his way around the palace. Though grievously sinned against, he found in his soul the goodness necessary not only to forgive his father, his brothers, but to resettle his entire family into Egypt where he could protect and provide for them. So who was Joseph? A pretty fascinating character. Maybe even a role model for our own behavior. But hidden in plain, plain sight in our text is another Joseph, capable of some calculating and cruel behavior. As a teenager, Joseph was vain and self-absorbed we have no indication that he did not enjoy the status of being the firstborn son of his most beloved wife. His self-absorption blinded him to the dangers of wandering alone into his brother's field camp, far distant from his father's protective gaze. The trauma of slavery, of being sold like an animal into a royal household, of being shoved into a prison on a trumped-up charge, and then of doing a favor for someone 
who promptly showed an amazing lack of gratitude. All of that both hardened Joseph's external shell and drove him to learn how to be more accurate in assessing every person and every situation. Well, he could see the future of the baker. You don't hear Joseph uttering a word of comfort or consolation. The baker was of no use to Joseph. And that forgetful wine steward finally came through in the end. So in this case, Joseph bet wisely. Then Joseph was swept up into the orbit of one of the most powerful men in the ancient Middle East. In Pharaoh's presence, Joseph determined that he would no longer be willing to be perceived of as vain and self-absorbed. With his rapidly growing acuity in being able to see the world through unshielded eyes. Joseph discovers the usefulness of being humble. His toolkit of skills, including divination, all had come to him, said Joseph, from God. Joseph described himself as a mere vessel of God's will. Now, I'm going to suggest that Pharaoh understandably was very impressed by how Joseph viewed himself because Pharaoh thought of himself as a god. And if Joseph saw himself as a vessel for a god, well, it would be easy enough to trust Joseph. So Joseph now takes on the role of Pharaoh's second in command and in that position, he had to guide the Egyptians through an extended agricultural crisis, a disaster. First, he carefully used up the foods stored by Pharaoh at Joseph's suggestion, but that surplus eventually ran out. The people pleaded for food, but soon there was no food to be easily distributed. So the Egyptians pledged their fields, their only wealth, to Pharaoh through Joseph. Take everything we own, just give us food. Now Pharaoh came to own much of the land of Egypt. And when all of the fields were sold, the Egyptians pledged themselves to be serfs for slaves, serfs forever to Pharaoh in exchange for what they needed to exist. Step by step, this Joseph used the crisis to pauperize the Egyptians and after pauperizing them, to enslave them. Joseph served his master very well. But then, but then his brothers appeared. Having recognized them, he chose to play a very painful, very cruel game of cat and mouse with them, setting little traps to increase their pain. He ran his lab, lab on human behavior just to test his brothers. Would they protect each other? Would they protect their youngest brother, Benjamin? Would they protect the well-being of their aged father? This Joseph had grown into a man deeply scarred by the experiences of his past. He constructed a shell of protection to help him climb an astonishing ladder of success, a ladder that reached from the very bottom of the pit into which the brothers threw him to the foot of the very throne of Egypt.
a ladder that, by the way, lifted him far above the pain that he was causing the people that he was called to serve. Well, this could have been the end of our story, but it wasn't. Challenged by his brother Judah, challenged by his own unfulfilled yearnings, challenged by all that it took from him to continue to be Safnat Paneach, the number two to Pharaoh in Egypt, that shell of protection cracked. It cracked and then it shattered. Beneath those royal robes and despite the royal signet ring, he was still Joseph, son of Jacob and Rachel, full brother to Benjamin. Tears unshelled, stored for decades, poured out of him. The father whose very existence he had blotted out now was a reality whom he would very soon embrace. And his brothers, his cruel, unfeeling brothers, might yet achieve a reconciliation that never could have been predicted. Pandering no longer, he now truly felt the hand of God controlling his destiny. Now, my friends, this is the Joseph we have every reason to celebrate. This is the Joseph whose story is worth telling Midorlador from generation to generation. After all, if Joseph could grow past his very own agony, then perhaps so can we. Shabbat Shalom. See you next week.